three countries came up in this book that I, as being world powers, Poland, Turkey, and Mexico, and Japan, and Japan. Japan is fairly easy. It's the world's second largest economy, much larger than China. It has a very large navy. It has a largest in Asia, in fact, superb air force, and a standing army larger than the British. It is a nuclear power, as soon as it wishes to be. And it is already the dominant power in alliance with the United States. Uh, not China. China is not the Asian power that Japan is. Turkey, again, is another case where people just haven't noticed. This is the 17th largest economy in the world. Uh, they are larger than Saudi Arabia. They are larger than about half the European economies. Their military is outstanding, can certainly defeat the Germans or the French or a combination of the two at any time. They're at a sea of chaos. To the south is the Arab countries, particularly Syria and Iraq. To the north are the Caucasus in chaos with Georgia. To the northwest of the Balkans. Central Asia. And if you go to any of these places, you'll find the Turks present. Um, they are intervening in Iraq far less because they want to, but they're being pulled into the vacuum that's being created by the Americans leaving. Turkey was the historic center of the Islamic world for 500 years under the Ottoman Empire. Whenever the Islamic world became organized, it had a Turkish uh, leadership. For the past 100 years, we've been in a very odd position that Turkey has been a small country. It's now returning. Poland is more mysterious, but really not. Poland is going to be the boundary line in this round with Russia. It is a country that's of enormous importance to the great power of the United States, which is engaged in massive technology transfer to Poland. If you want to understand what this means, consider South Korea. In 1950, South Korea was a country of rice farmers who weren't very good at that either. If you had said in 1950 that today in Canada uh, you'd be driving Korean cars and watching Korean televisions, people would have laughed uncontrollably. What made Korea the powerhouse it was? Uh, the technology transfer from the United States and favorable trade relations with the United States. Poland starts from a much higher position in most measures than the South Korea did. But if the United States is going to seek to block Russia, which it will, it will do that in Poland because it must. And there are tremendous benefits. Look at West Germany, look at Japan, look at Israel, the benefits of strategic alignment with the United States in terms of the creation of power, economic and military, is simply enormous. And uh, Poland is going to be the beneficiary of that. In the meantime, Germany, whose population will be about one quarter of what it is today in 25 years, and whose economy is breathtakingly undynamic, and which is caught up in tremendous dependencies on Russia and other countries for raw material, and which is the largest exporter in the world. It's not China, it's Germany. And it's totally dependent on other countries' economies being healthy. I mean, this is a country that's going to decline. One of the things that I see in the next century is all those European countries that now rank very high in the top ten are going to be slipping out of the top ten. And other countries, like Brazil, like Turkey, like Poland, are going to be slipping into the top ten economically and militarily as well. As for Mexico, Mexico is the 13th largest economy in the world. And I always start by saying the size of the economy, because people simply aren't aware. I mean, they don't, they don't look at the standings like they would in baseball or something. But I look at the standings every year, and I see countries rising regularly. And Mexico is one of them. It's a trillion dollar economy. And a lot of this is the fact that it's an, they have a successful internal economy going. Precisely. Uh, they get only about 6% of their revenues from exports of gas. They get far more money in from their exports of narcotics, which is, non, is it non-trivial. It builds the economy. There's a reason the Mexican banks are not financially as strapped as some other banks. They have cash pouring in every month, which is uh, part of the story. But if you go to the area north of Mexico City, you will see the largest auto plant in the world, the most sophisticated robotics plants in the world. You will see a very different Mexico than you expect to see. South of Mexico City is a different story. 
but nevertheless Mexico has emerged into the top tier of countries. It's number 13 and as number 13 it's rising and I expect it over time to force some of the European countries out and then it will be dealing with its a country to whom it doesn't have very warm feelings, the United States. You will be seeing in the next year or two uh, American troops along the border because of the narcotics problems but also because um, this border is getting hot. I don't expect war, perhaps not even the century. Certainly there will not be significant con conflict before the end of the century. But look, I mean, there are major issues between these two countries. There's a great deal of interdependence, but interdependence leads to conflict. And really, one of the arguments I'm making in the book is that the European age ended in 1991 when the last European global power collapsed. After 1991, for the first time since 1492, no European power was global, could project its military and economic force everywhere. And that was a sea change in human history. The only power that could do that was in North America, native to both the Atlantic and the Pacific. Well, there are two powers in North America that have enough weight. One is overwhelmingly powerful, but the other is Mexico. And never forget, number 13 is not a bad number to be in the hit parade. The book is The Next 100 Years, A Forecast for the 21st Century. I've been speaking with the author George Friedman and The Next 100 Years, published by Doubleday.